Walt Disney World is one of my most favorite places in the entire world. It's here in the Magic Kingdom where we can enjoy lands of adventure and fantasy and tomorrow. And it's all here because of one man. And while the guy behind me is pretty important to that vision, he's not the whole reason, the real reason we can enjoy the Magic Kingdom today. Come take a trip back with me as we remember why the most important Disney for Walt Disney World wasn't actually Walt. It was his brother, Roy. I don't think you've mentioned the amount of money at the initial investment. That's a heck of a lot. <laughs> that would indicate the size of this project. Well, there was a time in my life I didn't think there was that much money. Well, it's going to be uh, well over a uh, hundred million, 100 million plus, uh, at least. But my big brother says we can do it. He's a money man. <laughs> In November 1965, Walt Disney was joined by the governor of Florida, Hayden Burns, along with his older brother, business partner, and best friend, Roy, as the three of them would officially announce the upcoming arrival of what would become Walt Disney World. There was a tangible excitement in the room. One of the biggest construction projects ever undertaken was about to begin. Walt beams with an earnest optimism, a trait he would be known and beloved for, a trait he had always carried boldly. It was an ability afforded to him by the gentleman on the other side of the table, a figure considerably more unknown and mysterious. In Roy Disney, Walt had a special security and a freedom to imagine big. Together, they sat confidently before the most substantial project of their entire careers, knowing their exceptional playbook would be no different. There is no shortage of information to be found about the life and the legacy of Walt Disney, but the same can't exactly be said about his brother Roy. Walt was the charismatic face and persona of the world's greatest entertainment company. He was also the exact contrast to his modest and quiet brother. But that's the way Roy liked it. Roy Disney had no interest in the spotlight, but he had a great respect for his brother, and he found much to admire and cultivate within his lofty ideas. Roy Disney, born June 1893, preceded his youngest brother Walt by eight years. Even though Roy had two older brothers much closer in age, the bond he had with his younger brother was instantly unbreakable. His responsibility to keep, protect, and encourage Walt would be evident to everyone who was watching. Roy, as a child, would be known to arrange small chores around town so he could buy little toys and knickknacks to spoil Walt with. Right from the get-go, it seemed as if Roy had this innate desire to provide for his brother, and oftentimes indulge him as well. Roy and Walt shared a father in Elias Disney, a stern, hard-working man who found no practical future in Walt's boyhood passion for art and drawing. But in Roy, Walt Disney would find a great encouragement, a friend who appreciated his dreams. He would be a constant support that he could always rely on. Roy was his treasured mentor, and Walt would never know life without him. As children in Marceline, Missouri, they'd be inseparable, spending their days strolling the town, working the family farm, and watching trains. When their father would take ownership of a paper route in Kansas City, they would relocate and develop a strong work ethic together as overloaded delivery boys. Roy would eventually get a job as a railroad vendor, selling candies and papers and sodas to passengers aboard the local train. When Roy would leave that position, he would recommend his brother Walt as his replacement. He even loaned Walt the $30 deposit the railroad company required for goods and merchandise himself. But as it turns out, Walt wasn't too great at the venture. At the end of the day, his inventory would rarely match the product he sold. Perhaps as a daydreamer with a lack of money sense and specific business savvy, certain patrons found Walt easy to swindle, to take advantage of. Naturally, Roy wouldn't see the $30 again. Roy, at 19, would become a bank teller, his first dabblings in a realm of finance. And then in 1917, at the outset of World War I, Roy would enlist in the Navy. Walt, with a desire to follow in his brother's footsteps, was too young to serve and would eventually forge his way overseas as a driver via the less stringent guidelines of the Red Cross Ambulance Corps. Roy, while abroad, would develop a case of tuberculosis and upon an honorable discharge in 1919, would seek recovery and residence at a veteran's hospital in Los Angeles, California, 
unknowingly setting the stage for the magical empire to come. Meanwhile, Walt Disney would return to Kansas City and find moderate success with a small art studio as an advertisement cartoonist. Walt was now confident this is what he wanted to do with his life, and now with a firm grasp on his aspirations, Walt and fellow co-worker Ub Iwerks would launch their first art company called Iwerks Disney Commercial Artists. The venture would fail within a month. Walt would then get a job at the Kansas City Slide Company and would truly discover the art form of animation. In another bout of inspiration, Walt would launch Laughogram Studios, an animation company of his own design, producing advertising and story cartoons. Laughograms also would struggle considerably in almost every way. After 12 shorts in two years, the studios would go bankrupt and the venture ultimately fails. As Walt, emotionally spent, looked back over the wreckage of multiple defeats, Roy was there to extend his hand. Corresponding with Walt, he would suggest that he move out to where he was in California. What with Walt's creativity and his determinations, certainly he could find investors ready to promote his particular ideas, or at the very least, he could surely make it as a film director. So in 1923, under Roy's respected instruction, Walt would take a train out west with a suitcase and a reel of his latest work. It was an unfinished Alice comedy, which inserted the live-action footage of a young girl, Alice, into a whimsical and animated world. Walt would spend his first weeks in California pitching the concept around Hollywood to potential investors, with the goal of finding a way to fund and complete and distribute the finished short. One night after many months, an exhausted Walt received a telegram from a New York City distributor with an offer to produce six Alice comedies at $1,500 a film. Walt immediately ran to the veteran's hospital, and with it being the middle of the night, he snuck in to wake and talk with his brother. He needed Roy's insight. This was the ticket, Walt declared, and immediately petitioned that he and Roy should start their own studio and go into business together. As partners, Walt could be the artist, and Roy the producer and skilled business manager behind the scenes, gifted where Walt had so often struggled. Roy, foreign to filmmaking, was a bit skeptical, uncertain in his own abilities and future, but confident in the creative brilliance of his brother. And Roy accepted, and under heavy medical instruction, he would check himself out of the hospital and begin raising capital for the brand new studio, the first contribution of which would be his own. It was an important vote of confidence for the burgeoning enterprise. The combination of Walt's creativity and Roy's business savvy would be the beginnings of one of the most extraordinary partnerships ever formed, and it would see the official initiation of the Disney Brothers Studio. Roy, along with his brother, would wear many hats. He would play cameraman, accountant, and so much more for the Blossoming Studio. They started production in their uncle's garage and would live together in a rented room, and any profits that they made would go back into funding and staffing the studio. And soon, it would start to pay off. The Alice comedies were a hit, and the distributors wanted more. It's safe to say that the Disney Brothers Studios found its success because of one simple principle. Walt's visions and dreams for the future would keep the studio moving forward, while Roy's strong knack for business and negotiations would somehow make it all financially possible. Walt would paint the big picture. Roy would read the fine print. In 1926, they began building a studio proper on Hyperion Avenue, where Roy would encourage Walt to change the name of the studio to Walt Disney Studios. Roy felt that Walt was where the creative talent, the heart and soul of the company was, and reasoned it should be the focus of the company name. Walt, a lover of the limelight, did not dispute this. There would be many obstacles and challenges to face in the road ahead, but they would face them and learn from them together. That's not to say there would never be disagreements or even flat out fights, but Roy always knew when to stand firm and when to relent. When Walt carelessly signed a contract with some shady loopholes regarding the first Mickey Mouse shorts, Roy would have to find a way to pay the significant penalties of a broken contract. Walt in this situation would again prove himself foolhardy where paperwork was concerned, and thus he would forevermore trust his brother with contracts and finances and all these types of business dealings. Walt would go on to push the medium forward with visionary ideas like cartoons with synchronized sound, cartoons with technicolor, 
different methods for inking and painting, a multi-plane camera, and full-length features, and so much more. Roy, a master of strategy, would somehow find a way to fund these costly projects by sweet-talking bankers or navigating merchandising rights or perfectly evaluating public stock options. The brothers would share a lack of understanding in the other's talents, but at the same time, they would show a severe confidence in them. It was a natural alliance, an ideal balance that bordered on perfection, and despite multiple setbacks and speed bumps, the Walt Disney Studios would go on to find unimaginable success. When Roy helped me back there, I was all alone. I was in this business. Roy had no connection with this business at all. When I came out here, my first thing, the first thing was that Roy had, had helped me, and I wanted to, Roy and I to be partners. That was all. I mean, we just wanted to be partners, you know? I wanted to. Well, Roy not knowing the business, he didn't know what we were in, but Roy had a faith in me, and I think that that uh, Roy has done a lot of things there against his better judgment because he felt that I wanted to do it. And Roy has never been a person to want a lot of money. Roy has been one who was, as, uh, could be content. And most of our arguments and, uh, and uh, disagreements, I think, have been because Roy has felt that he had to protect me. In the late 1940s, Walt came to Roy with his latest idea. He called it Disneyland. And Roy said no. Roy, the sensible businessman, found the enterprise extremely risky because he now had a duty to protect stockholders and they were, after all, a film company, not an amusement park company. But Walt believed in the idea and he would attempt to find a way to fund the massive project himself. Walt would put his life insurance and savings on the line. He would sell his vacation home and gain personal loans from friends and employees. He would fully fund a small company called Wed Enterprises so he could go forward and develop attraction concepts and systems without the inclusion of the banks and shareholders. But even after all of that, he still came up short of the needed amount. So once again, Walt would go to his brother with an inventive idea to complete the funding by partnering with a television network. Roy's business senses were piqued. The Disney name meant something, and Walt wagered that Roy could broker a lucrative deal with a television network that would fund the rest of the project while simultaneously promoting the new park and the Disney brand. Roy, astounded by his brother's creativity, found this method logical and figured it would significantly reduce the steep financial risk he had been concerned about. Shortly thereafter, Roy would venture to New York City and shop the idea to several TV networks. He would mastermind an incredible deal with ABC. The Disneyland Hour would be a massive rating success, well before Disneyland would officially open in 1955, amidst much fanfare and praise. Things were going great for Walt and Roy. Disneyland would be a great and growing triumph. The film division of the company continued to produce hit after hit. The Walt Disney Company was at the height of its glory and it would all have been impossible without the specific abilities of both Disney brothers at play. With a great amount of wealth, achievement, and stability in the company, Roy began expressing an interest in resigning from his role as the CEO and finally retiring. But Walt had one more idea. And here they were again in the Egyptian room of the Cherry Plaza Hotel at the helm of the most magnificent project of their entire lives. There was a strong endorsement and excitement in the air about the massive enterprise awaiting ahead. It was going to be different. It was going to be innovative. It was going to be Disney. There was a confident spirit, a special pride at that table, connecting the brotherly team as they faced the press seeming more unstoppable than ever before. And there was little doubt Disney World was going to be their most impressive achievement yet. No one in the room would know at the time, not the press, not Walt, not Roy, that in just over a year, Walt would be gone. As we got off the elevator on the floor and I saw Ron go striding into dad's room and then come out with his arms up like that as though someone pushed him back and uh, when we went into the room uh, I don't really I mean dad you know his hands were on his chest and 
uh, and he was gone, and Uncle Roy was standing at the foot of his bed, and uh, he was massaging one of Dad's feet, just kind of caressing it, and he was talking to him, you know. And I don't know, it sounded like something like, well, kid, this is the end, I guess, you know, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I saw his love, because I've never seen it before. After the shocking blow of Walt's passing, it seemed like the dream of a Disney World would be just that. Without Walt at the helm, perhaps it would be more frugal, more responsible to just cut the losses and drop the project altogether. But Roy, the biggest believer in Walt and his visions, would champion the company to demonstrate his motto and keep moving forward. Roy felt more compelled than ever to see his best friend's final dream come true, and now the greatest and most beautiful burden of their entire partnership would be placed fully upon him. His first decision as the head of the Florida Project was to rename it from Disney World to Walt Disney World, promising that everything inside it would be a celebration and a reminder of the man in imagination who started it all. And so, Walt Disney World construction was underway. An impressive orchestration of classic Roy Disney business acumen would then unfold as he would take out the baton and begin truly conducting a masterpiece. He would raise millions of dollars in funds through specific bonds, paying them off via rising stock prices and more, and etc, etc, etc. He would delegate the tasks of creativity and construction to the most capable of people. Under Roy's leadership, teams of talented Imagineers worked thoughtfully around the clock, bringing Walt's visions to life. When financial shortcuts presented themselves, and many would, Roy would reject them if they differed too greatly from Walt's original plans. Roy would direct the creation of the Reedy Creek Improvement District, a Florida-authorized sector exercising revolutionary legislation that would give Walt Disney World unprecedented power in terms of the resort's responsibility and jurisdiction. The project would employ state-of-the-art technologies and construction practices, and Roy would oversee all of this and so much more. While Walt was absent in body, his sentiments lived on through Roy, who would have the final say-so on all major decisions. And if they weren't as Walt would have had them, they didn't happen. When asked why he would sacrifice so much of his time and energy for such a massive project in his twilight years, Roy stated, I didn't want to have to explain to Walt when I saw him again why the dream didn't come true. Walt Disney World is a physical manifestation of perhaps the purest form of love and dedication a brother has ever given a brother. Since Walt had been a boy, it seemed as if Roy's mission in life was to just do right by his kid brother. In spite of great success and personal victories, this was the foundation of who they both were. Without any of the extra prosperity they would come to know, they would always be brothers, the best of friends, perfect compliments to one another. Walt Disney World was going to be Roy's lasting tribute to his brother, and if Roy had anything to do with it, he would ensure for Walt that it would be something sensational. This has been a wonderful reception given us here. All the faces seem friendly and uh, you feel very much at home. And that's uh, just a big exciting project for us too, you know. And in fact, it's the uh, biggest thing we've ever tackled. And I might, for the benefit of the press, explain that my brother and I have been together in our business for 42 years now. He's my big brother, and he's the one that, uh, when I was a little fellow, I used to go to with uh, some of my wild ideas, and he'd either straighten me out, put me on the right path, or something, or if he didn't agree with me, I'd, uh, I'd work on it for years until I got him to agree with me. But I must say that uh, we've had our uh, problems that way, and that's, that's been the proper balance that we've been needed in our organization. And uh, he watches out for the financial side of it, the corporate side. And uh, in this project, though, I'd just like to say that uh, I didn't have to work very hard with him on this project. He was with me from the start. 
Now, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> the final cost of Walt Disney World was in the neighborhood of $400 million. But with Roy's financial prowess behind the scenes, the Magic Kingdom would open without the company owing a single cent of debt. Moments before the dedication speech in October 1971, Roy would become flustered. I can't do this without my brother, he said. Go find Mickey. He's the closest thing we have to Walton. I want him up there with me. And it was so. Mickey Mouse would stand by Roy for the park dedication, which was perhaps by Roy's intention, left out of the opening day broadcast special. Walt Disney World is a tribute to the philosophy and the life of Walter Elias Disney. And to the talent, the dedication, and the loyalty of the entire Disney organization, that made Walt Disney's dream come true. May Walt Disney World bring joy and inspiration and new knowledge to all who come to this happy place. A magic kingdom where the young at heart of all ages can laugh and play and learn together. Roy would then spend most of the afternoon outside of the park, floating in a boat on the Seven Seas Lagoon, where, away from the crowd and commotion, he could finally take a deep breath and reflect on the memory of his brother and the huge accomplishment that they had just delivered together. When the television special would air days later, Roy would spend the majority of it weeping in his wife's lap. With Walt Disney World officially open to the adoring masses, Roy would finally begin preparing for his retirement. He began the process of transferring his responsibilities to new leadership and made plans to go on an extended Australian cruise with his wife. But before all that, just three months after the opening of Walt Disney World, Roy, age 78, would lapse into a coma spurred by a cerebral hemorrhage and would be rushed to the same hospital he had said so long to his kid brother in almost five years to the day earlier. How greatly the universe had changed since then. A whole new world had been built and the magnificent dream of Walt Disney would continue on into eternity simply because of one quiet, humble brother's wholehearted devotion. Dream building is a term you'll see around the parks from time to time, and it serves as a perfect embodiment of what the Disney brothers achieved together. Walt was the dreamer, and Roy was the doer, building it up and making it so. Walt and Roy were the ultimate dream builders, made effective by their sweet and lasting partnership, a partnership built on love and respect and trust. We can go to the Magic Kingdom today and find Walt everywhere, most notably in the Central Hub, Represented by the partner statue where he stands proudly with his creation Mickey Mouse happily gushing with delight in front of Cinderella Castle. Some say Walt in this statue is pointing up towards the crowds, the sea of entertained faces within his magic kingdom. Others suggest he's explaining to Mickey the grandness of the dream now fully realized right where they stand. But I like to think he's pointing up towards Roy. Roy immortalized with a sequel statue in 1999 by the same sculptor, Imagineer Blaine Gibson, is seen sitting discreetly on a park bench by the flagpole in Town Square. It's a very mindful homage to the life and the character of Roy Disney, serving as an unobtrusive introducer for a day in the Magic Kingdom. Gibson designed with special intention Roy's posture, which tells a unique story of him enjoying the beauty of the park, seated contently in a happy place when Minnie Mouse approaches him to socialize, and Roy is glad to do so. We can see how Roy holds up her hand in support, a natural quality he had exhibited for Walt his entire life. We can observe Minnie looking up to Roy, appreciative and endearingly, just as Walt surely would have. Roy sits calmly with a joyful smile, savoring the company, knowing full well his brother Walt waits back behind him. 
a similar grin on his face. Roy Disney is perhaps the most unsung hero within the Disney company, and that's probably the way he would have liked it. We often salute Walt as we should, there'd be no magic without him, but often forgotten is Roy, the supportive brother who would do whatever possible thing he could to pull that magic into physical space, and so for that, we salute him too. So next time you're in the Magic Kingdom, stop by and say hi to Roy, and thank him for supporting his brother, and believing in the dream, and building the magic. There'd be no Disney World without him. Thanks, Roy. And until next time, we'll see you in the happy place. Bye.